I want to share a, a brief word today before we pray collectively. I had a conversation that kind of prompted my heart. And this, this scripture I'm going to share kind of confirmed what I wanted to share. <clears throat> it's a, excuse me, <clears throat> it's a complex, uh, I'm sorry, it's a simple uh, concept is what I was going to say, that as a believer, hopefully we've all grasped, but I find that sometimes people struggle with this and therefore it causes them to be hesitant in their prayer life. Because what I'm talking about is the sense of unrighteousness, the sense that I don't deserve to be heard, the sense that I'm not quite sure about my salvation. I, I hope that I'm saved. I, I think I'm saved, but I'm not quite sure. And, and even if I am believing that God saved me, I don't know that he wants to hear me because, let's face it, I've sinned. I, I've fallen short. I've missed the mark. I want to attack that concept head on because the enemy uses that. And even in our own minds, and you heard me when I prayed, I said, don't even let us in our mind feel like we're separated from his love. We know the word of God says nothing can separate us from the love of God. But you know, in your mind, you can convince yourself of a thing. And for you, it will be so because you won't believe God's word over your mind, over your thoughts, over your imagination. As a man thinketh, so is he. If I think I'm poor, the fact that I'm rich may not mean a thing because I'm acting like I'm poor. If I think I'm rich and I'm really poor, it doesn't matter because in my mind, I'm rich. Now, there'll be some limitations to how much I can buy, of course, but my attitude, my tone, my way of seeing things is regulated by what I think. We know the word of God tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I want to come against this lie, this misconception, this misperception, or just plain old misunderstanding about our righteousness and our right standing with God. And why we can confidently pray is because of that right standing. So look with me if you have your Bibles, if you want to jot it down, look at it later. In Psalm 143, I'm going to start from verse one, just going to read uh the first couple of ones hear my prayer O lord give ear to my supplications in your faithfulness answer me and in your righteousness do not enter into judgment with your servant for in your sight no one living is righteous we know that the word of god says that we are the righteousness of god in christ jesus but aside from being in Christ Jesus, no one is righteous. There's not a living being that can decree themselves to be righteous in and of themselves. He said, do not judge me. Enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight, no living one, no one living is righteous. And at his juncture of living, that was true. Christ hadn't come on the scene yet. They had to go before the God that they are God and, and bring sacrifices of animals to, to cover their sins. So if they messed up, they had to go to the priest, bring a sacrifice, the priest had to kill the sacrifice, put it on the altar. All of that was the ritual, if you will, that preceded the move of grace. When Christ came, he was the last sacrifice. So therefore today, we don't have to go kill no pigeons, Lamb, rams, lambs, or anything else. He was the sacrificial lamb of God. Why is it important to understand that? Because though we are not righteous in and of ourselves, we are decreed righteous. We are declared to be righteous by God once we accept Christ. You don't have to take my word for it. I'm going to show you in the book of Romans which, I mean, I'm sorry, Book of Romans. I can take you there too, but I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Romans, of course, backs us up, but prayerfully this makes it even clearer and quicker to understand. Verse 18 in 2 Corinthians 5 says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing 
that's the New King James Version, NIV would say, not counting, their, their, not imputing their trespasses to them or not counting their sins against them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So in other words, in Christ, our sins are no longer counted against us. It's not that we sin, don't sin because we still fall short in the natural. It is that in the spirit, God has already seen the blood of Jesus as the propitiation or the, if you will, the, the sacrifice, the payment for your sin. We know Romans 3, 23 say all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So when we sin, we deserve death, but praise be to God, we had an advocate who never sinned, so he died in our place. So when we accepted Jesus Christ, our sins were atoned for, paid for, in full. Every sin I will ever commit, every sin I've ever committed in the past is covered by the blood of Jesus, washed away. My sins are no longer counted against me. So therefore, when I sin today, I have a consciousness of it. I confess it to God so that I can have a clear conscience before God and I ask him to forgive me. But my spirit is already cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So technically that sin is already forgiven. I'm speaking it out of my conscience. I don't want to have offended God. I don't want to have disappointed God. So therefore I say, forgive me. Just like if I love you and I offend you, even though though I know you're still going to love me, out of love, I'm going to say, forgive me. I, I messed up. Forgive me. I fell short. I went to the store the other day <clears throat> to order some new glasses. These aren't it. <laughs> but I went back <clears throat> to get them, and I should have tried them on in the store, but I got home. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, I got some new glasses. I tried them on. I'm like, what in the world? I can't even see out of these things. Well, come to find out they didn't do the prescription correctly. So I go back to tell the lady that there's a problem. She tried to make it about me. Well, you didn't do this and you didn't. Oh, well, hold, hold up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The point I'm making is she messed up uh, and she tried to blame me. In Christ, when we mess up, we don't have to uh, worry about the, the blame falling on us, so to speak. But rather than fess up, in her instance, the appropriate thing to do would have been to say, Miss Carr, I'm sorry, we messed up. It's already going to be taken care of, no problem. But rather than do that, her ego or her lack of professionalism, whatever, she would never own the fact that she messed up. Some of us are like that with God. We don't even want to own the fact that we messed up. We act like, God, you understand my heart. You get it. Da, 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 da. And yes, he knows the heart is wicked. That's what he knows about your heart. The point I'm making is in the spirit realm, we're, it's taken care of. You know, she didn't have to go through all that. They, they're going to take care of the glass. All she had to do was just say, we made a mistake. But rather than do that, she wouldn't own it. Like us, our sins are taken care of. It's covered. We are cleansed. We are healed by the stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we love God, we don't want to do something that offends him. So we own it. We say, Father, I messed up. Forgive me. I don't even want to have that on my conscience between you and me because I love you that much. I know you've already paid for my sins. I know technically I don't have to say forgive me, but he said, confess your sins one to another. Then he said, confess your sins that you uh, can be cleansed of your sin. There's a cleansing of the heart and there's a cleansing of the mind. And when I confess it, it cleanses my conscience and I don't have that thing kind of dangling over my head. I don't have that conviction in my heart from the Holy Spirit that I've messed up. But my spiritual standing with God never changed. Just if I have a, a child, like I have two, who from time to time mess up, Lord have mercy. But guess what? Whether they own it or not, whether they come back and confess and admit it and ask for forgiveness, they are still my children. They ain't got to come back and say, can, can I be your child again? You never stop being my child. You might be my wayward child. You might be my child that got on my last good nerve, but you're still my child. So
So in the spirit, no matter what you do, once you belong to Christ, you belong to Christ. You are born again. You can't be born again again. You are a child of the most high God. So all of that is to say your standing with God is already established in Christ. Let me finish reading this because I got caught up. So we said in verse 19 of chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Not going to preach about that, but you have a ministry to let the world know. You have the ministry of reconciliation. Your job is to let the world know God in Christ is no longer counting instance the against them. That's good news. You ought to be telling everybody you know. And then verse 20 says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's our job. Let the world know. Verse 21. This is the critical piece. For he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what does that tell us? This is the best deal in all of the universe. I will take your sin. And in exchange, Jesus says, I will give you my righteousness. Good God Almighty, it don't get no better than that. God says, here's your sin. Jesus said, give me your sin. And in exchange for your sin, I give you my righteousness. So when God sees you today, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees a saint. Now, some of y'all are messed up because you can't even imagine yourself being called a saint. But the truth of the matter is your sainthood didn't come from what you did. Your sainthood came because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So today you are a saint of the most high God. You know how we call Saint Peter? I can say Saint Letty, Saint Michael, good God Almighty, Saint uh, Marilyn, Saint Michelle, Saint Psalm 107 too. I can call all of y'all saints. Not because you had this pious life, but because you put your faith in Jesus. Now, because you love God, if you've truly been born again, you want to live a pious life. You want to do the thing right. You want to live holy. So therefore, you come back to him and confess when you messed up. You try to get it right. It is not that we are, are sinless, but if we're in Christ, we're being processed. We're being sanctified so that we sin less. And over time, we start to look like Christ more and more and more. He who began this good work in you will see it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So you are a work in progress, but you are already established in the spirit as a child of God, forgiven of every one of your sins. So why is that important? Because if you are now, as the word of God says, you are the righteousness of God in Christ, you're in right standing with God, you can go before the throne of God boldly without hesitation and believe that God wants to hear your prayer because he says, my ears are attentive to the prayers of the righteous. Well, that would be you if you are in Christ Jesus. So his ears are listening. How many of us aren't praying because we're afraid that our prayer won't be heard? So we go to somebody and say, can you pray for me? Because I need so-and-so. It ain't nothing wrong with asking somebody to pray because I ask folks to pray for me in a heartbeat. But I know I can get a prayer through because I know I'm the righteousness of God and I know his ears are attentive to my cry. So I want you to pray with the boldness that God has given us and the confidence that he wants to hear you and that he will answer your prayer. Let me just end with this one verse and then we're going to pray. In Hebrews chapter number 14, 4, verse 14, read these three verses. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, good God, come on somebody, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that's why when we pray with a boldness, 
We shouldn't think that's strange. We shouldn't be hesitating. We should be praying like we know we have a right to pray because the God we serve has decreed us to be righteous in his sight. And therefore we can come boldly to his throne. And the beautiful thing is we will find grace and we will get the mercy that we need. My, 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 it doesn't get no better than that. So I want you to pray like you know today that you are a child of the most high God and that God is listening for your prayer. Don't hold back. Don't be hesitant. Don't worry or doubt. Pray with the boldness that says, I am a child of God and he's waiting to hear from me.